Okay. Um, uh, good morning. And um, sometime today you should get a bibliography, a set of books and papers that would be useful for this week. And I'd similarly do one for next week. And hopefully you all will have it. Already. Beg your pardon? Is it possible also to add the slides that you are presenting? Or? It will depend on, on the powers that be. If you make some sacrifice to the gods, maybe that will happen. I don't have any objection. Right? Um, see, but as you, uh, yeah, I mean, I will make them available. I don't know if, if they have the. They're all on Keynote. Is that, oh, I'll make PDFs and give them. Yeah. No, because Keynote, PowerPoint, et cetera, et cetera. OK. All right. Uh, so uh, today, I, I mean, that's, that's the only slide on display today, nothing else. <laughs> right? I was talking with some people about volcanoes last night. and. Um, there's, there's some Indonesian volcano. <laughs> um, what I actually want to do today is what I promised yesterday, that we will try to just go through the algebra of the Kuramoto, because uh, A, it's, I think it's one sort of very useful model that was invented. It's highly applicable in a variety of uh, situations. And, um, you know, and, and there are some features of it which generalize easily to other systems, uh, which I would, no, this way, I noticed that that was not, okay. Okay, so one could start by writing model quite generally like that, where you have n oscillators, um, n of these phase oscillators. And uh, just to tell you how some of these generalizations can happen, um, one can think of uh, having an adjacency matrix. So if uh, oscillator i is influenced by oscillator j, then that quantity, uh, you know, we can take Kij is equal to coupling between uh, uh, i and j. All right. The model that Kuramoto solved was all Kij equals k. That is, they are all the same, and they are all equal to one another. And this is an example of what today is called global coupling, or when every oscillator is connected with every other oscillator. Uh, it, it's just all of them are equal to, to k. But clearly, you can think of having a variety of different. You can put, for example, the Kuramoto model on networks. Um, and I know that several of you are working with uh, networks. So, I mean, if you put them on a network which is just linear, where i and j are only, where kij is non zero when i and j differ by 1 and 0 otherwise, right? So that's just nearest neighbor coupling, which is local coupling. You can also think in terms of having kij depend on this difference i minus j, so that the coupling goes down or goes up, depending on your whimsy, um, as a difference in the indices. So. I mean, it's, it's up to you. Put it on a Bethe lattice, put it on a hypergraph, put it on whatever. Yeah? Um, and the behavior is different and interesting. And since Kuramoto described his model in 1975, or maybe even a little earlier, it's probably been studied. Okay? So these models have been explored in great, in great detail. Okay. So we are going to consider the case, as I said, of all of them the same. And uh, 
we have this order parameter r e to the i psi is just summation 1 over n of e to the i theta i. Okay. And um, we can write this equation in the form of theta sub i is just omega i plus k r sine So we'll deal with all forms of this. I, I hope that uh, I'm just recapping. Yesterday this is going to be very little. Uh, okay, so just to tell you that this is where we stopped yesterday, and what I'm going to try to do is to give you a better. I mean, I hope hopefully a better intuition of what's going on and why uh, this problem is solvable also. All right. Okay. So, um, given this, we'd like to uh, we'd like to take the limit of n going to infinity, and then instead of having individual um, phase oscillators described with this index i, I will think in terms of having a density of which is a function of theta, uh, omega, and t, and Theta goes from minus pi to pi. Uh, omega goes from plus to minus infinity and is drawn from some uh, distribution g omega. And all, all that I'm going to describe today is only for the following kind of distribution unimodal uh, with one maximum. Okay, now uh, clearly the integral of this from minus pi to pi, uh, d theta, that's, that's just a normalization condition. And um, we've, okay, again as I pointed out yesterday, one simple uh, solution for this is that rho is just equal to 1 by 2 pi, okay. independent of uh, omega and t, and uh, independent of theta as well. Uh, so that, that just tells you that uh, with a uniform density, everything is just swirling around that circle. Okay? It's incoherent because when it's all swirling around the circle, r immediately goes to zero. Because it is just a large sum of random numbers over there. And yeah. Why does the no you don't I mean uh, you don't have to also integrate over omega because the omegas are given to you they are drawn from some distribution I mean there will be a there will be a normalization which is a, a rho of theta, uh, theta omega t times g of omega that is equal to one. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. But, you know, the whole point about this exercise is that in the long, I mean, we're going to look for stationary solutions. So we want rho to be invariant in time. All right? So, I mean, there will be stuff moving around, but the whole density itself will be invariant. Or we're going to try to find solutions like that. Okay. So... Uh, now, r e to the i of psi, which is that sum, gets replaced by the integral, um, let's say minus pi to pi, uh, d theta, e to the i theta, delta of theta minus, uh, the sum over j. And that's the same as the integral from minus infinity to infinity, d omega minus pi to pi d theta, uh, e to the i 
theta g of omega, omega rho of theta omega t. Okay. So, at the end of the day, okay, the objective of this algebraic exercise is the following. We want to find r for arbitrary k, and in particular, we want to know what happens when k increases such that r, which initially is 0, for k is equal to 0, when there is no coupling whatsoever, theta is just equal to omega t. If theta is equal to omega t, then you can put down i omega t over here. And that integral, because of the fact that we also will be assuming, I should say, that this is equal to Okay, so uh, G is symmetric about the distribution is symmetric, positive and negative values. Big one? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Okay, so if it's symmetric around that, then uh, that's, I mean, we'll take all those into consideration. So uh, for k equals 0, r is 0. Um, and the point is that if you start with some distribution, initially the r may not be 0. right? But if they are, as a function of time, asymptotically, you will find that r will go to 0. OK. So. Uh, Now, the continuity equation that rho satisfies is partial rho with time plus partial with respect to theta Okay, the number of oscillators is conserved. You've got this density that's moving around. And this is the equation that it, it that rho has to satisfy. Okay. Now, um, for the stationary solution, we want this to be 0. So we would like this quantity to be 0. And that basically says that if the uh, if the inner bracket over here, if this is equal to, sorry, if this is equal to zero, then this implies the following: that omega by k r modulus is equal to sine of psi minus theta, and clearly uh, there are only real solutions for this theta and psi if uh, omega by kr is less than 1. Yeah? Yeah. Unimodal, okay. sig one maximum. And of course, um, I mean, you don't have any physical condition on the... No, on the width, no. Okay. Right? I mean, eventually everything, you know, if you increase k uh, large enough, you will be able to get everything down to some common uh, psi. Right? But, other, you know, for today at least, other than the fact that we want uh, uh, g to have a single maximum, Right? I don't want to, uh, there is no other restriction on G. Um, things like a flat distribution you'll see are difficult, uh, or at least this doesn't naturally extend to the flat distribution. All right? But um, there is, I've given a, a paper there uh, in the bibliography today 
uh, by Martins, where they look at a bimodal distribution, and then you will see what happens when your distributions are not as simple as just, okay, today we will just look at the Lorenzian, um, where G is just equal to gamma over gamma squared plus omega squared, We we'll just look at that. All right. So, um, I mean, I, I had said all this. Yes, yes. Uh, so, this uh, thing in the bracket could be any arbitrary constant. So. No, no, no. And you see, we want this entire thing to be zero. I mean, we want a. This is your continuity equation. Given that, I want to have a stationary distribution in rho. One way of doing it is to have this quantity equal to 0. Right? But it's not the only solution. It's not the only solution. I'm just I'm looking for the easy way through. Other solutions can be found in the bibliography that I've given you. No, I mean, see, you have to do a certain amount of work for it, and I want to largely uh, focus on the essential ideas over here, all right? Okay, one can just imagine that there's some complicated row which, when you take the derivative, is all equal to zero, but it's not easy to find, okay? All right, so this condition tells us that there's a range of thetas that can there can be a solution. That solution will then give us a value for psi, and that is the common frequency, or the, the common phase that these oscillators have. Uh, what, see, for example, what we saw yesterday was this, that in the coupling is, sorry, when the coupling is uh, very weak, you've got stuff moving left and right pretty much without being influenced by, the, by each other in the extreme picture. For intermediate coupling, you find that many of them align onto a common, a common phase, and that is just this condition, that only when this quantity is less than one, those are those oscillators. The ones for which this is not true are going around at their own, in their own merry way. Yeah? You increase the, the coupling, they also fall in line. All right? Okay, so, I mean, this is, <coughs> this is exactly the effect of increasing K. Because as you keep increasing K, more and more of the omegas will come down. See, this is the, okay, this is basically this definition. Yes. All right? Yeah. When I go to a large number, I have to, I have to choose, uh, okay, the thetas come with it, you know, there is a density of, of uh, oscillators. Yeah. This density is rho. But then why do we always add the integral over uh, the omega? Because the rows, I mean, because the variables of this problem are theta, and omega. So, and so, okay, so if we are in T, oh, if there are in infinity, we say that they are distributed. Yeah. You could, if you want, you know, you can get rid of all the, uh, the uh, distribution of thetas um, and go for something, you know, you can, you can have maybe a uniform distribution in omega. And then you will not need, okay? Meaning, if, look, for the moment now, I'm just allowing myself to have random, initial random velocities, phase velocities, omega. And then I want to see how this entire population evolves. And obviously, uh, you know, we need, I mean, for, for two, I mean, okay, maybe I, maybe I will give this as a homework. Just take two phase oscillators and see what happens. 
Okay, because that you can do analytically. All right. So, um, all right. So, um, what is this? You know, given the fact that this solves, uh, you know, the particular equation. Um, let me call these as the locked solutions. Okay. So this. Uh, and this quantity is then, all right? So we'd like one, this to be smaller than one, and then you've got that going. For the others, which are moving around the, uh, they are moving around this particular circle, right? Because they are not able to solve this equation. They set up a current, which is just equal to this velocity, I just put down as a modulus. Times rho of the unlocked, or what I'll just call them, the drift. Drift solution. So the point is that for arbitrary k, the oscillators separate into two groups with different numbers of oscillators in each group. In one group, you've got all the ones that have somehow locked onto a psi. In the other group, they are moving around, okay? So instead of having a single row that describes the entire lot, I will basically have two components, one which are moving around independently, uh, sorry, in phase with each other, and another which are just moving around at random, okay? So this helps me now to write down the overall density as a sum of two components. And this, uh, the sum of two components is the following. Uh, let me just write down rho is equal to either Okay, so for one group, they all satisfy this particular condition, right? And for the other group, it is just C upon that quantity, okay? The drift part is just here. The reason I'm looking so, I, I seem to, you know, always this difference between psi minus phi and phi minus psi. I'm not being super careful over here, but hopefully it'll all come out in the end. Um, notice that the sine inverse has got two roots, and of the two roots, only the stable one has to be taken. All right? And that comes out as a uh, heaviside function on cosine of theta. So of the two roots that will come for any given value of omega and k, right, you choose the one which has got the positive root. Um, it's, it's a simple stability analysis, which unfortunately I will only cover tomorrow, uh, but I will, you'll, you'll see why. Anyway, so that's the point. So here is, for, you know, for uh, any given value of k and r, this is the solution that you get. Yeah? The eight, okay, what I'm pointing out are that there are two roots for the sine inverse. One of them is stable, one of them is unstable. It turns out that the one that is stable has cosine, which is positive. And I'm just asserting it.
All right. So given the fact that we now have an expression for rho, um, the expression for r is, as we have already seen, d omega d theta e to the i. Now it is theta minus psi g of omega rho of lot plus rho of drift. Okay. What I have done is to take the e to the i psi over here over onto this side. Uh, the rest of the expression is the same, and I'm just pointing out that these two, uh, that these two are now, uh, it's broken into the parts, which are the drifting and the locked part. I wrote it down a little differently yesterday. If I wrote it down at all, I'm sorry. Little change. Okay. Now, the reason uh, we consider these two separately is that this integral, uh, which is d omega d theta e to the i theta minus psi um, g of omega rho drift. This rho drift is just a constant divided by omega plus kr sine theta under modulus. Right? So this is just the part of R that comes from the drifting ones. And you can see that supposing all the, uh, all the oscillators were just drifting positive, negative, R would be zero. That was the first, first thing that we started by considering. K was equal to zero, and the actual integral R, R turned out to be a good order parameter because it sensed that, right? When r is equal to 0, all the oscillators are uncorrelated and moving around by themselves. The same is true over here, that this part just goes to 0. All right? And here you can see it by the following fact as well, that g of omega is equal to, uh, OK, so there are these symmetries. g of omega is equal to g of minus omega, and rho of theta plus pi minus omega is equal to rho of theta omega. Yeah? One is the distribution coming from the locked ones, the purple ones. For the delta. Yeah, so the delta. The other is the part coming from the drifting ones, the green circles. For the other one. This one. If you have essentially independent oscillators moving around in a circle, their contribution to the real part of the order parameter is zero. Okay, because they are incoherent. Right? And this symmetry, when you apply it onto this, will just tell you that it cancels out. Okay? So this integral just goes to zero. Um, and we are left with the second integral. And the second integral is just this delta function. So let me put that down. Okay. So this is our contribution from the uh, locked.
Yeah? Per che? Symmetry. Huh? Symmetry. Oh, okay. You know, it's... Yeah, yeah. But, for example, in the, the base case, uh, well, 1 over n. Yeah. Uh, R is 0. Because they're uncorrelated, they're moving around by themselves. Okay. Yeah? I'm doing it for that case, all right? I mean, remember this is, I'm describing Kuramoto's work 50 years later, all right? So, um, yeah. Okay, so now this part is actually much simpler because we know what to do with delta functions, and this entire integral, therefore, just becomes becomes an integral of g of omega uh, d omega. OK, so what I'm going to do over here is to do the integral over theta, right? And replace theta minus psi over here by sine inverse of omega by kr, right? So uh, e to the i sine inverse omega by kr, OK? So uh, this, the delta function evaluated just gives us this. And now I want, um, OK, and remember that r is real. R that is coming from the locked part is real. So let me just take the real part of this integral and rewrite that as cosine of omega by kr. Oh, cosine of oops. that's the real part of that exponential. OK. And now it's just standard uh, doing some algebra. I set omega by kr is equal to 0, uh, to theta. And this, therefore, becomes um, d omega becomes kr times d theta, et cetera, et cetera. So this will just give me the integral uh, of from minus over omega less than less than kr of kr d theta that's the d omega g of omega but omega is just kr um, sine theta just one second, let me. Uh, okay. Omega by kr I'm putting down is equal to theta. So, of uh, course, uh, ah, my, my mistake. I'm sorry, it's not that that I want. I want this to be equal to sine theta, right? I want the argument of the cosine. The time out. All right. Okay. So this is my integral. We've got that right. Okay. Now I want to change variables to sine inverse omega by kr is equal to theta, or omega by kr is sine theta, or omega is that quantity, right? And d omega, therefore, is just cosine theta times kr times d theta. 
¿Ya? They do, but I mean, that's right now not the most important part. Okay? Okay. I'm almost there to get you <laughs> the critical care, so that's part of the thing. Okay. So now I've got, yeah? It's not that theta which we. Uh, it's, just a new variable. it's a new variable. I mean, we call it delta, right? Not delta. Call it something else. Z. No, not Z. Z is complex. Uh, language is so restrictive. <laughs> I mean, this is an integration integration variable that we're going to uh, be taking. Okay. So this integral now just becomes from minus pi by 2 to pi by 2 of k r g of now omega. And omega is this quantity. So g of k r sine theta right, times cosine squared. See, there's one cosine theta coming from here by definition, and one coming from the derivative, so cosine squared of theta d theta. Okay, so this is now our expression for the order parameter, and I'm just going to rub this part out because this is that r is equal to that. OK. There's one solution that you can all already see, which is that r is equal to 0 that comes out of this, because you've got r on this side, and r on this side, and r over here. So let me be selective about uh, just dividing out this r, that 1 is equal to that quantity. This is a k a constant, so I can bring that out. And now I have that expression to evaluate, all right? Now, the point is that the, as we've seen in this picture, as k keeps increasing, the order parameter is actually zero for a while. And it's only above this critical k, k sub c, that you get a solution that comes out of the r is equal to 0 solution. So at that particular point, we must have this. Okay, At that point, we will have this solution that 1 is equal to kc integral over d theta g of when r is 0 at that particular point as it's coming out. So g of 0 cosine squared of theta. This is just an argument over here that, I mean, we, we know this, let's just say this is a fact that we know experimentally, that r is 0 when you start out. We know that r goes to 1 as k goes to infinity. We're looking for the transition. I mean, in a sense, I'm just uh, I'm trying to, uh, in a sense, what is happening is that there are solutions. As we've seen, r is equal to 0 is always a solution, OK, from, from that. Since r is equal to 0 is a solution, we would like to see our new solution rising out of it. It's essentially bifurcating. The new solution is coming out of the r is equal to, out of the incoherent one. So one way to estimate when this will happen is to just ask, when does this integral give us 1 if I start out as r is equal to 0? OK? And uh, Okay, so, uh, this, so this is the integral that I now need to evaluate. And 
see, so 1 is equal to k sub c g of 0 integral of d theta cosine squared of theta. And this quantity is an easy solution, right? Which then gives us that k sub c, or the critical k, is just 2 over pi Uh, why not g of 1? Uh, see, if, if I have r is equal to 1, that is that line over there. This solution doesn't, I mean, you can't get the onset of this particular curve from this part. All right? OK, so let me just draw your attention to what are the important points over here. The first is that the details of this distribution, as far as determining the critical k, they are important only so far as the value at 0, which we have taken to be the, the position of the maximum. So the value of the distribution at its maximum is the only thing that really matters. Okay. And the final expression is quite simple. Okay. And uh, now my problem is that I don't actually remember. As you've seen, this is a very sort of schematic. I, I, I wish I remembered what the model was taken and so on. But it is basically a Lorentzian. I forgot the parameters of the Lorentzian. Right? Uh, so here, if you look at what is g of 0, g of 0 is just 1 over pi gamma. So kc for this Lorentzian model is just going to be 2 times gamma. Yeah. See, the, the coherent ones don't necessarily have k equals 1. It's only when uh, so r is equal to 1. It's only when everything is in coherence that you will have 1. Okay. All right? But what is true is that r is equal to 0 is always going to be a solution. Yes, that's okay. Okay. Yeah. And why then, yeah, I don't get why you use G0 and why you And this is just formally, this is the way of, of doing it. Namely, I ask what is, you know, I'm asking for solutions of this equation, which in a sense, OK, my only handle over here is R. All right? R is equal to 0 is the solution. So I'm asking, I mean, obviously, I can't put it in the earlier equations because that, that's not, you know, we had r is equal to, uh, I don't know what was over here. Maybe there was an r as well, right? Now, if I put r is equal to 0 over here, there's nothing. So I'm just choosing to put that out over here. Uh, I should have a better mathematical argument for doing it, and I will try to you know, do that at a point, but I'm just trying to give you an intuition. At the point, at the transition, r is equal to zero. At the transition, that's when it's going to be moving up. Yeah? So I'm just trying to figure out the point where it moves up in terms of k by solving this equation. Yeah. 
Oh, the circle is just trying to give an idea of what does R mean. Here, when you've got K much below Kc, all the phases are distributed around the circle, and the value of R is some small number. So R is something close to zero, actually. Yeah, yeah. This is this R with this funny arrow. The, the arrow is just the length of R. Okay. Over here, when all, all of them are together, it's the same arrow is just grown. Okay, thank you. <coughs> yeah? Yeah. Yeah. So theta depends on R. Yeah. So when we say R equals zero, theta is the infinity or something. That's right? Uh, so my thing is this, that theta is not this theta. I know, I know. Uh -huh. I'm thinking about the distribution we get. Like theta equals R sine omega over PR. Right. So theta depends on R. So when we say R equals zero, yeah. when I, I mean, uh, <laughs> I'm going to be wrapping myself into knots over here, but I'm looking for uh, a solution of theta. I'm not looking for theta equals zero over there. I'm looking for kr times sine of this is equal to zero. It's uh, okay. I mean, look. Let's discuss the mathematical nicety of it. I do understand that there is a there is a. I need to give you a better feeling of why we are looking for this bifurcation out of this. The, uh, there is the r is equal to zero solution, and we need to come out of there. And for that, we just determine the validity of this equation. And this equation gives us uh, the integral is just that, kc times g0 times whatever. Uh, and then that's just pi by 2. And finally, I mean, the result that I would like you to look at is that the critical uh, the critical coupling for a non-zero value of R is is to is is just uh, whatever two over pi times the maximum of the distribution. All right. Oh, this is just for the Lorentzian I'm giving as an example. I mean, if you had a Gaussian, you, whatever. Oh, we could have done, I mean, I'm, I just did it as a Lorentzian to tell you that because this simulation, if I remember correctly, was with a Lorentzian. You can do it with whatever unimodal distribution you like, and that will be the answer. Uh, Kuramoto did it with the Lorentzian 1970, whatever. Okay? Uh, and he did no simulations at all. It was just, just the theory. It's going to be a critical point, and the new solution comes only after that point. But, I mean, the point before this, R is also zero. R is zero. So why is it that we are, we're getting a particular K and this particular R and not other things here? See, it's like this. There are many solutions to this particular equation. OK, many solutions. One we can immediately identify is R is equal to zero. And r is equal to 0 will turn out to be a solution, a coherent, a coherent solution. OK. Overall, there is no discussion of the stability of any of these states. So the coherent state, is it stable or not? We don't know. Is the incoherent state, that is stable, presumably. But at some point, it has to become unstable. Otherwise, the stable solution will never come out of it. You'll never see a phase transition. If the incoherent state was always stable, right? And then, meaning that there are those, those issues which I'm really not getting into, because they are quite complicated as to is this state stable, is that state stable? 
For the moment, I just want to take one feature. Below KC, this non-zero R solution doesn't exist. So where can I find this transition point? Okay. It also turns out that, the, that this solution that we get over here is in fact the stable one for K above KC. And for K below KC, the incoherent solution is the stable one. Put it this way, if I started out with a coherent distribution of thetas below KC, they will just spread apart. Okay, so it is just the determining of the transition point that I need to set r is equal to zero in this equation and solve it. This is just, by the way, it's for this example because I showed this phase transition curve. Yeah? Yes, Tommaso. Uh, we take uh, the real part because mm. we see that r is real. But, r is uh, No, I, I wrote down the order parameter as a real times the phase, no? R e to the i psi. I mean, it, by definition, it was. Yeah, yeah. Okay, now, um, <clears throat> all right, so the, uh, what I want to now do is to consider a somewhat different and very powerful way of solving the same problem, right? Okay, this is a, is a method that was in, introduced uh, in the 2007-2008. Uh, it's called the Ott-Antonsen method. Uh, some of you might have seen it before, but this is now the method of choice for how to address some of these issues, okay? Right. Um, can we discuss some of this later in person with gloves or without gloves? <laughs> All right. Um, I'd like you to remember this, and using this solution and a little more algebra and work, you can actually figure out how k depends, how r depends on k above kc. I, I will not uh, do the derivation, but I'll just point out that r in this, but in the case of the Lorentzian, actually, it turns out that r goes as one minus k, uh, kc by k. So, not, so this curve over here is given by 1 minus kc by k, all right? And in the limit of k going to infinity, you get that r goes to 1. I'm just giving a result without deriving it, but it's straightforward. I have skipped a fair amount of discussion of this transition, so I'll, you know, I'll probably just scan this page and put it up. Because I, I do want to consider the Ott-Antons and Ansatz, and because it's, it's important, it's powerful, and it's necessary to learn. All right, so let's go back to this continuity equation, d rho by dt of theta omega t, is equal to minus zero okay let's rewrite uh, Okay, I'm now going to go back to the complex definition of R and call it R twiddle. Okay. 
Okay? And I want to rewrite this as um, kr by 2i e to the i psi minus theta minus e to the minus i psi minus theta. Yeah? Okay, let me just tell you what I'm doing right now. I've expanded this sign over here. I want to go to this variable r twiddle, which is just the complex order parameter. Right? So r times e to the i psi is just going to give me r twiddle, and r times e to the minus i psi will go give me the complex conjugate of that. Okay, so given that partial of rho with time is just omega plus k over 2i times r e to the minus i theta minus r complex conjugate e to the i theta times rho. Okay, this derivative was on this side. Okay. Now, rho is periodic in theta. So it seems like a good thing to try to do a Fourier expansion of rho. In other words, let me say that rho of theta omega t is 1 over 2 pi summation n going from minus infinity to infinity rho twiddle of n omega t e to the i n theta. Okay. That, that allows us now, because I have a derivative in time on one side, I have a derivative on theta on the other side, and what I'm going to do is just to tell you what happens when I differentiate and collect all terms with a common uh, n, everything multiplying the same phase e to the i n theta, that will give me the following equation, partial of rho sub n with time plus i n omega rho n. And I'll discuss the origin of these various terms in a moment. K n by 2 r twiddle rho twiddle n plus 1 minus r twiddle star rho twiddle n minus 1 is equal to 0. And n goes from minus infinity to infinity. Yeah? What? Uh, it's just the Fourier components. It's a label on the Fourier, you know, it's the standard discrete Fourier transform that I'm doing. Okay, so it's just a mathematical It's just a number. I'm letting n go from plus to minus infinity. Rho, sub, rho twiddle of n is the Fourier components, right? It's a standard thing. Just, just one second. Uh, okay, no, go ahead. Uh, It's like, when in doubt, take the Fourier transform. <laughs> or the Laplace transform if it's more appropriate. Meaning, no, okay, no, 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 no. See, everything is, see, we are looking at phases, you know, stuff is all 2 pi periodic, all right? And it's the kind of thing that you need to do. 
I mean, the meaning that of all the mathematical tools that you might like to apply, whenever you see a periodic function, let's just see what happens. I mean, this is, I mean, the, this is not exactly how it's done, but what I'm saying is that uh, there is no there is no a priori reason. See, we've already solved the problem in one way. There's no a priori reason that you have to do it, but I'm just pointing out. Uh, so, so far you have conserved uh, difficulty. You had an integral over all of space and all of frequency, etc. You converted into n equations, and they're all coupled. I'm just pointing out now, uh, <clears throat> just the question of taking derivatives. Uh, if you take the derivative in time over here, you'll just get rho n twiddle times e to the i n theta. Omega is just multiplying rho. So again, in, uh, and there is a derivative in theta, so it just gives you i n omega times rho n. In these two terms, there is one factor of i n that comes uh, the appropriate term to, uh, to take the derivative of will be uh, rho n plus 1, because you're losing one power of e to the i theta over here, gaining one over here. That's, that's just, I mean, I'm just helping you to ca keep count. Yeah? So you get this equation. And now comes the brilliant part. Ott and Antonsen made the assumption that let us consider a class of functions such that rho n twiddle is just equal to some complex number alpha to the power n. All right? So they took the subscript and made it a power. Okay? But that was done with a lot of intuition and a lot of motivation from other studies looking at various values. And this is, a, this is a restrictive class of functions. See, remember what this row tells you. One second. Let me point out that this is a function of. These are time-dependent functions. And we are going to try to find a solution for row n of t, right, which asymptotically goes to a stationary distribution. So if I start with, I mean, there's a lot of mathematics in this paper, and I've given you a reference to the paper. So, I mean, it, but you are equipped to understand most of it. Right? I mean, there's some stuff about, there are always things that Ed Ord does which two people understand. Him and God. <laughs> No, but jokes apart, this is, a, this is the definition which is restrictive. You're asking for all these Fourier coefficients to go down as a power law, all right? And all, I, all that is being asserted is that this is not an unreasonable thing to do. Also, post facto, when having seen that it works and it works very well, then you say that, aha, this must be the way it, it, in which it is, right? So, I mean, there's a little bit of both. But just see what happens. I've got n over there. Um, I'm going to, this is a, a step which will appear in your tutorial, so you will have to do it. But finally, what happens is, uh, that once you take the derivatives and you throw out all the common parts, you get an equation, do partial of alpha with respect to time, plus i omega alpha plus k over 2 r alpha squared minus r. And magically, n has disappeared. Right? Okay. So this, okay, this is an ansatz. 
well justified, but it's just I'm over out of the blue. Right? But the use of this ansatz, I mean, is, is that it is, you know, it's good and valuable and all that. But what it helps us to do is to take an infinite dimensional system, because that was, this is, after all, an infinite set of coupled equations. They're coupled because the rho n and rho n plus, plus and minus 1 and n are all mixed in over here. And now you finally have one equation. And this one equation, if you can solve it, which you can, uh, you, it should give you the correct solution for the, uh, for the problem in, in, in hand. Okay. So the fact that n drops out is extremely important. And uh, you can do a lot of things with it. Uh, in particular, yeah. Big button. Yeah, alpha. Alpha is complex. R and in uh, uh, everything is complex. Okay. Okay. Now, let me remind you that our twiddle was just the integral of d omega d theta g of omega e to the i theta rho of theta omega t, right? And I don't want to do too much algebra over here. Or, uh, so I'm now going to replace this by the summation of rho n right, omega t right. um, and out of all these if I just look over here and do this integral then the only term that's going to survive when I do an integral over d theta is going to be the term is just going to be the term rho n1, because that's the only thing that will be constant. Yeah? OK, so this is an integral over d theta of e to the i theta summation of rho twiddle n e to the i n theta. The only term that will survive will be the term which does not depend on theta, because everything else will integrate out to 0. And the one that does not depend on theta, here there's 1. And so the only term that will be important is n minus 1, so that entire sum will vanish when I take the integral over theta. Oh, yes. I mean, I've taken the integral. But then also the 1 over 2 pi. 1 over 2 pi will also go because of that. And so finally, our twiddle is integral of d omega g of omega rho twiddle of n minus 1. Of, of, of n will go to 0, so this is minus n star 1. Uh, I'm using the fact that the complex conjugate of rho is the same as the negative of the uh... yeah. 
We have the conditions which I'm going to let you read in Kuramoto's paper. Okay, but I want all the alphas to be less than one. I, I want this entire series to be convergent, okay. right? And, I, uh, and then n has to be positive, et cetera, et cetera, okay? See, I will, uh, eventually we're going to try to solve many of these problems by summing geometric series because this is a, these are powers, right? So the, all the conditions that require convergence will be there. I'm just leaving them as mathematical niceties for the moment because I want to just get ahead and try to, uh, to show you that our main aim is to go for R, right? And R basically depends on the first component of the, the first term in the Fourier series, okay? Now, uh, yeah? Why only on the first term? I just did the Fourier integral. See, this is, again, because this, this is e to the i theta summation of rho n e to the i n theta. This, this is going to be the operative part of the integral. So let me bring that in. Right? And now if I take the integral from uh, theta going from minus pi to pi, I integrate over the circle, the only term that will contribute is when this exponent is zero, because there are as many pluses and minuses on everything else. All right? So the only term which will actually be that n plus one is equal to uh, zero, all right? And so n is equal to minus one. But then, little thought over there on the Fourier expansion will tell you that rho n, rho twiddle of minus one is rho twiddle star of one. Okay, and that's what I'm just using over here. Beg your pardon? Is symmetrical in theta. Yeah. Okay, and the advantage is that this will help you to find, for any given value of r, what is alpha, right? Or vice versa, because I can change that now to alpha star of omega and t. I should sort of just alert you to the fact that the Kuramoto model is one which tends to equilibrium, right, in the long term. I mean, there is both dynamics and, you know, ideas of statistical mechanics over here, right? Because at any given, at any finite time, as you have seen in all these calculations, you know, you don't get clear behavior until you go to asymptotics, all right? So we are going to start with some arbitrary alpha. That arbitrary alpha corresponds to arbitrary initial values of rho. And then ask, how does this evolve? And where does it evolve? Does it evolve towards r is equal to 1, or does it evolve towards r is equal to 0? And that, looking for the change in behavior, is what is going to give us the transition point. Okay, so finally we've just got one expression for r, and uh, this is going from minus infinity to infinity, okay? And what uh, Ott and Antonsen did, I mean, apart, that was the first level of brilliance to say that everything, all the coefficients are just power laws, related by a power law. The second part is to say that we can now extend this into the complex omega plane, right, by analytic continuation, right, and try to evaluate this integral by the residue theorem. Okay, so that's, a, I mean, that's a second assumption that you can do it, 
and they showed that you know if G is sufficiently well behaved, the number of uh, singularities that exist in the complex plane is finite. Right? And in this particular case, it just turns out that um, when you evaluate it by the residue theorem, you can just ask what uh, this whole thing comes out to be. It has, uh, you see, if I take the Lorentzian, okay, the two poles are just as gamma plus or minus i omega. Right? Or omega is equal to plus or minus i gamma. Okay. Which are, <coughs> Okay, those are the two poles for the Lorentzian. So for, this is now specific to the Lorentzian, not to arbitrary cases. In arbitrary cases, I'll have to take some G, find out where its poles are, right? And um, then all you have is that R twiddle is just equal to alpha star of this quantity. So I gamma and R twiddle star is just equal to alpha of I gamma T. Okay. All right, we are almost home in the sense that what needs to be done now is to substitute the alphas over here with R. Okay? Once I've done that, then all I have to do is to separate out real and imaginary parts, and I will get a single equation for the real order parameter. So uh, partial of alpha with respect to time just becomes partial. You see, alpha is just equal to r twiddle I'm just writing it down over here. See, i omega is just gamma. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. And Alpha is just, uh, let me write it, and then plus k by 2, alpha squared r twiddle minus r twiddle star is equal to 0. So you've just, I've just replaced various things over here. Um, and this uh, alpha squared squared, I can go into R twiddle squared, and R, okay, yeah. So this is now specific to the Lorentzian case. Here, there is a single root, a uh, single pole in the complex plane, which is at I omega, at minus I omega, at uh, minus I gamma. And for that particular solution, um, I find that R is just alpha, and R star is just it's complex conjugate. R is alpha star, and so on. Anyway, putting these two solutions for alpha wherever they appear gives me an equation that just involves R. Right? And now I remember that R star, this is just equal to R e to the minus i psi. And this will give me, uh, and this is just equal to r e to the i psi, and so on. Okay, so putting that in, taking the derivatives, and proceeding, you get the following equation, dr by dt. Okay, there are, this is the derivative of psi 
and there's a derivative of uh, r. Uh, you know, you've got to take the derivatives of both the parts. I'm just looking at all the real parts now. I get dr by dt plus gamma uh, r plus k over 2 into r cubed minus r is equal to 0. And the same algebra will tell you that d psi by dt is equal to 0. OK, so this is, as far as we are concerned now, the solution for the Kuramoto model with the Lorentzian distribution of, function, of uh, frequencies. Using the Ott, Antons, and Ansatz, you get the following equation, which, because there is only a single pole, uh, the, I mean, the residue theorem is just not more complicated. If there are more poles, you have to add over all, the, all of them. And so on, you, you know that uh, well enough, right? And then finally, you come down to a single first order differential equation for R, the real part of the order parameter. And this will give us, in principle now, R as a function of time. which is what we needed. Okay. I'm not going to give you the solution of this, because this is the first order differential equation, which we can all solve. Right? But the point is that this works amazingly well, not just for the Kuramoto model, but for all sorts of variations of the Kuramoto model, or for all sorts of other oscillator problems. So this is a technique of great generality, and it applies in just such an amazing variety of places, as you will discover, I hope. All right. Yeah, just start at the back. Yeah. yeah uh, what is the meaning of the order parameter depends on time? See, physically, it just means that this is a non equilibrium, you know, any, for any finite end, this is a non equilibrium system. And so, what you will find is that. This is, uh, you know, R will take some time to go to its asymptotic value. That's all. Nothing more than that. Okay. So the, the main limitation here, or the main restriction, is the, that the coupling has to be two pi periodic. The? The coupling has to be coupling. two pi periodic. The coupling has to be two pi periodic. I mean, all sorts of things have got to hold well for this. Right? In reality, like, where do we find this type of coupling? Uh, I mean, so many natural systems are 2 pi periodic in their coupling. The sun and us, for example, in some appropriate units of time, 2 pi. Yeah? Meaning it is not as unusual as, as all that. Okay. The real restriction is that you are stuck with a certain class of functions that you can play with. But what Ott and Antonsen and then later others have shown is that this is a very mathematically sound methodology. You can actually use it for an amazing range of functions. I'm sure there will be uh, situations where it doesn't apply. But the point is more to know when it applies and there why it applies, because it could turn out that the problem that you choose to study, as you know, I, I will not have the time to do all the applications of such uh, things, but you can just look around in the literature and you'll see that it's actually, it applies to uh, places where you don't imagine such a thing. Supposing you have two communities of Kuramotos, one Kuramoto with one strength of coupling, another Kuramoto with another strength of coupling, and the two of them are coupled with some intermediate, uh, you know, the, the study of cliques or communities, for example. And I know that many of you are interested in this kind of a problem, that the intra-clique uh, coupling is much stronger than the coupling between cliques. You find that Ott-Antonsen can be used in that situation also. 
uh, you split row into two, for, you know, two parts, one for each click, and then you can apply your tantons in there, and so on and so forth. So it's an amazingly powerful kind of technique, um, and it's just something that uh, you should know. I mean, today's uh, lecture was mainly to show you, I mean, to sort of bring it into the class and for discussion. Uh, there are a lot of mathematical issues, okay, but most of them are solvable. That is, they don't necessarily apply to, uh, you know, to the range of problems that you might be interested in. There will always be a singular perturbation somewhere. Yeah? So let's stop here for today, and I'll try to get a homework out to you all. Hello, Professor. Hello. Um, several questions. Um, 